Minister of Computer Science. I, re I record all my talks, so I figured uh, out. Okay. <laughs> so Manolis is a professor of computer science at MIT. He's also a member of the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. Um, Manolis actually did his uh, bachelor, master's, and PhD uh, at MIT. Uh, and I won't go over all the awards that he won, but one of the awards that he won is uh, the MIT Sprouse Award for the best PhD in computer science. And I guess after that, they locked him in and didn't leave him. <laughs> he wasn't allowed to leave. Um, so Manolis works at the interface between computer science, biology, and medicine. Uh, he's played and continues to play leadership role in a number of international consortium, uh, including uh, the well-known ENCODE and, and Roadmap. He's developed uh, many tools that have a significant impact on the field of epigenomics including uh, Chrome HMM, which you probably know, and his papers have been cited more than 120,000 times. Um, it would be great, Manolis, to host you in person in Montreal, but I guess that will be uh, for, for some other time. Uh, for some of you who are familiar with Manolis' work, you'll know that his paper, one of the challenge to himself, I think, that he sets is to have figures with as many panels as possible. Uh, I don't know what's your record at this point. And, and similarly, uh, with his talk, he, he includes quite a number of, of slides and content. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to the presentation. And I hope you've all had your coffee so that you can, uh, you can follow. So Manolis, you'll have uh, 15 minutes for the presentation. I'll, I'll give you a note after 45 minutes. Then there'll be 10 minutes for questions and further discussion in breakout rooms. So, uh, but Manolis, over to you. Awesome, thank you so much, Guillaume. And thank you everyone. I'm really bummed not to be there in person. And uh, I really hope that uh, the madness of always traveling the world to see our colleagues and talk science will uh, pick up again. Although I have to admit that uh, spending a little time with family is also a wonderful break from, from the rat race. So what I'd like to tell you about today is our work on single cell dissection and manipulation of DC circuitry in order to understand how to translate genetic findings into therapeutics. That's all I have to say, I'm, I'm gone. <laughs> um, so um, as we all know, uh, genetics has been an incredible success, revealing more than 120,000 genetic loci that are significantly associated with a diversity of disorders. Uh, here's one example for body mass index, a measure of obesity. You can see here the genome-wide association study hits. Every SNP is a, is a dot, every single nucleotide polymorphism. And you can see here in this Manhattan plot, appropriately named for the skyscrapers, these genetic associations for several loci that are indicating a genetic basis for obesity. It's not just your fault, there's a genetic basis for it. Uh, the strongest among them is this FTO locus, which was promptly renamed fat and obesity associated. So that gives us great promise. Maybe by understanding the genetic loci, we'll actually have more handles for manipulating disease. We'll be able to understand the mechanism of disease, discovering new target genes that were previously unexpected, discovering new therapeutics, and enable precision medicine and personalized medicine. The challenge, of course, as we all know, is that in the vast majority of these regions, the hits are simply non-coding. There's not a single uh, variant that actually disrupts the protein of these locations. So what, what that means is that we don't actually know what the target gene is. We don't know what the causal variant is. We don't know the cell type of action. We don't know the relevant pathways or the mechanism. In this example for FTO, we have 89 common variants that are spanning this 50 KB region of association in the first intron of the FTO gene. You can see the tiny little exons here, exon two and exon three, and the very large introns are simply not disrupted directly. There's no amino acid alteration. In fact, what we are gonna show is that the FTO gene itself is not even the target here. The true targets are sitting 1.2 million nucleotides away. So how do we systematically understand these regions? How do we make sense of the circuitry of these non-coding loci? And again, this is not just an academic exercise. 93% of the disease variants are in fact sitting in non-coding loci that do not have a single protein altering variant. The approach that we take in my lab, and I think it's common with very uh, many in the field and in this, uh, in this uh, meeting here, is to 
start with genetics across both common and rare variants. Here I'm showing a different GWAS now for Alzheimer's disease with APOE here and many other uh, AD genes. We start with genetics and then we systematically try to bridge the gap between genetic variation and disease by profiling RNA and epigenome variation between individuals in both healthy and disease samples. I don't have to introduce the epigenome here, but I will say that we are going to be focusing on DNA methylation, DNA accessibility, and histone modification, the three main forms of uh, epigenomic variation. We're going to be looking at this variation in healthy individuals to understand how genetic variants control it, and also in disease samples to understand how genetic variation and disease variation together are contributing through both genetic effects and potentially environmental, behavioral, socioeconomic, and other effects. We're then going to be integrating the data to predict driver genes, regions, and cell types, and then testing our predictions in human cells and in mouse models, disseminating the results and starting the cycle again. This is what we mean by circuitry. When you open up the hood in this region of association, you can basically find individual SNPs, individual variants, the enhancers where those variants are sitting, the cell types and tissues where these enhancers are active, the upstream regulators, and the downstream target genes, and ultimately the cellular and organismal phenotypes of those genes. So instead of just saying there's something going on here, we know where it acts, how it acts, who are the upstream regulators, the downstream targets, effectively the circuitry. So why does helping, why does having the circuitry help with disease? The first is the first way is that by understanding the circuitry, we know where to intervene. We have knobs. So in this particular case, I'm going back to the FTO locus that I showed you in the first slide. And now I'm showing you the circuitry that we found in collaboration with Melina Klausenser and many others. In particular, we found that the 50,000 nucleotides can be traced down to a single nucleotide the 89 common variants to this one variant that disrupts uh, AT-rich motif for this AT-rich interacting domain by changing a T into a C for the risk individuals. I am a homozygous risk carrier. So I'm a, I have both obesity associated copies, which basically gives me an extra seven pounds of adult weight. Uh, thank you, mom and dad. But uh, hopefully we can do something about it. So how do we figure out how my cells change with that variant. What happens is that there's a 50,000 nucleotide region out of which 10,000 nucleotides are a super enhancer, which is active in early adipocytes when the adipose cells make their decision to become fat burning cells or fat storing cells. In other words, through a process known as thermogenesis, heat generation, our brown adipocytes or beige adipocytes are able to dissipate excess calories in our diet through the form of heat by depolarizing the mitochondrial membrane, weakening the gradient of protons, and then uh, losing energy in the process. By contrast, they can also choose to store energy in fat, a very energy rich uh, cell where the lipids are basically stored into white adipocytes that become larger because of their lipid content and eventually help with all aspects of the biology of our body including our brain and all kinds of other things. So that decision, that differentiation decision in the first three days of differentiation of adipocytes is where that super enhancer is active. When the motif is disrupted, the arid 5 b repressor can no longer repress that super enhancer. The super enhancer is overactivated, derepressed in the risk individuals, leading to overactivation of IRX3 and IRX5. These genes are sitting 1.2 million nucleotides away and 500,000 nucleotides away. What do these genes do? What we found out is that they are new, previously uncharacterized master regulators of this process of thermogenesis and the decision in cell fate determination. This is extremely important because it gets to the essence of the goal of GWAS, which is to find new target genes, new therapeutic targets. So maybe these can now be new targets and this process can be a new target for combating the obesity epidemic. What we found is that these regulators, in fact, shift from the uh, lean phenotype to the obese phenotype when overexpressed. Why are we excited about the circuitry? For manipulation. So let's see what manipulation does.
we can increase or decrease the, up, the expression of the upstream regulator, ARID5B, increase or decrease the expression of IRX3 and IRX5, the downstream target genes. And also we can use CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing, not therapeutically, of course, but to establish the causality of that one nucleotide alteration. And we're gonna be shifting it from T to C and from C to T. What we find is remarkable. We can basically switch back and forth the, between lean and obese phenotypes like a switch by flipping any of these knobs. In particular, in primary adipocytes from obesity risk individuals that are homozygous for their obesity allele, we see that they are unable to thermogenize measured by oxygen consumption rate, but by altering a single nucleotide in the genome, they're able to completely restore the cellular phenotypes of thermogenesis. I'm showing you only one panel of uh, some, something like 14 panel uh, figure from uh, this paper, as Guillaume mentioned earlier, where we actually try every single alteration. We're basically changing the nucleotide to look at the effect on the enhancer, to look at the effect on the target genes, to look at the effect of the upstream regulator with and without the motif. And we basically tested every combination, but this is quite striking. It basically tells us that out of 3 billion nucleotides in the human genome, by editing a single nucleotide, we can completely restore the cellular process. This goes unlike every kind of assumption that we make of GWAS having weak effects. And part of the reason is that we are now going in in an isogenic setting, changing only that one nucleotide, and we're also taking, of course, the strongest genetic association with obesity. And we're also uh, doing this in a cellular phenotype rather than all the way to the organismal phenotype where the effect on, on weight is relatively modest. But the effect becomes even stronger when you look at the downstream target genes. When we overexpress a dominant negative form of IRX3, effectively shutting down IRX3, we would expect basically a shift from storing fat normally to just overburning of the fat. And that's what we see, basically shut down of IRX3, basically turns on this pathway and turns off that pathway. The mice start out leaner to start with, but the remarkable result is when you put them on a high fat diet, the normal mice, basically unchanged mice gain weight as, as anyone in this room would, but the homozygous uh, dominant negative mice, basically that are shutting down IRX3, are basically unable to store uh, energy. So basically they are simply uh, burning every calorie. They're not eating less, they're not exercising more, they're doing you know, just everything else normally, but their fat stores are completely depleted. Uh, so this is what we would like to do for every single disease locus. We would like to understand the mechanism, understand the circuitry, and build tools that enable us to do this in a systematic way across 120,000 disease loci. And this is what I'm going to describe today, our work to, number one, build reference epigenomes to predict disease-relevant tissues uh, in, the, in collaboration with ENCODE, Roadmap Epigenomics, and more recently, IHEC, to combine genetic, epigenetic, and transcriptional variation across individuals and also in the context of disease to understand this path of causality, then turn to single cell dissection of these epigenomic and transcriptional changes, understanding cell type specific genetic effects by combining both bulk and single cell studies, looking across multiple phenotypes together, multiple tissues together, and then the high throughput dissection of that circuitry. So I'll start with the epigenomics roadmap project, something that was published in 2015, and my group helped uh, integrate the, the analysis across the consortium. And what we have here is <clears throat> uh, the set of adult embryonic uh, tissues, the primary cells, embryonic stem cells, iPS cells, and all of these iPS derived cells. This was an incredible collaboration across many, many, including Martin Hurst in this room and many others uh, across, across the field that basically mapped H3K4ME3, a mark of promoters, enhancer associated K4ME1, transcription associated K36-trimethyl, polycom associated K27-trimethyl, heterochromatin associated K9 trimethyl, and then uh, several marks of both enhancer and promoter activation, including H3K27 and H3K9 acetylation, as well as open chromatin, DNA methylation using whole genome bisulfide and other approaches, uh, and gene expression. This is what we see when we integrate all these data. 
what we basically see is that we can actually get a map, a painting, an atlas to explore the epigenome of 127 cell types at a glance. Here we're looking at a one megabase region in uh, surrounding this Pax5 gene. And you can see here how promoters are extremely stably open. You can see that promoter marks are always there, ready for business. These transcription associated marks are only turning on in the tissues where genes are transcribed. You can see these enhancers acting in very tissue specific ways. And you can also see that this Pax5 gene, for example, is very strongly repressed with polycomb repression, except for a handful of cell types where it turns on. You can also use this to start painting where what cell types are specific regulatory regions and specific disease associated regions active in. In particular, if I care about non coding parents in this locus, I can basically say, oh, well, it turns on specifically for these two immune cells and this one encode cell line. And if I want to now understand what are the target genes of this locus, I could basically say, well, maybe it's the genes next door. But what I see here is that there's a correlation where this gene, Pax5, turns on along with these massive regulatory elements spanning all the way here, suggesting that perhaps the targets of this non-coding region would not be the genes next door, but in fact, genes far, far away. So we can use this to not only gain insight as to the landscape of the epigenome, the dynamics of this landscape, the shutting out on and off of different genes and regions, but also to start linking the genome together, to start inferring some of that circuitry. But we can also do this not just in one locus at a time, but across the entire genome. We can basically ask, what are all of the disease-associated loci in these thick bars and individual SNPs in these peaks? And how are they overlapping with our enhancer annotations across the different cell types and tissues? And what we can see is a little bit of a diagonal here, where genetic variants associated with distinct traits are enriched in enhancers that are active in distinct tissues. Looking at the real data here, we can basically see that genetic variants associated with height localize in enhancers that are specifically active in embryonic stem cells. Genetic variants associated with diverse immune traits localize in T cell and B cell enhancers. Genetic variants associated with blood pressure localize in the left ventricle of the heart, enhancers specifically acting there. Fasting glucose-related traits, you can see here this very specific enrichment for pancreatic islands. Cholesterol, HDL, LDL, et cetera, localizes in enhancers very specifically active in the liver. If you look at inflammatory bowel disease, you see two enrichments, both for these immune cells, which makes sense given that it's inflammatory, but also for these digestive tissues, suggesting that there's in fact two sets of driver uh, tissues. And if you look at Alzheimer's, we were actually quite surprised that we saw zero enrichment in all these beautiful pristine brain samples that the consortium had gathered. There was nothing there for Alzheimer's disease. Instead, we found an enrichment in this ENCODE cell line of CD14 plus monocytes. And this is a marker of both monocytes that are circulating the blood and tissue resident macrophages in each of the tissues, as well as microglia that only make about 5% of the human brain. And in fact, when you look here at brain, perhaps the reason why we're not seeing the enrichment is because the vast majority of brain is in fact the neurons, oligodendrocytes, astrocytes, and only to a, letter, a lesser degree. Only five to 10% of the cells are in fact microglia. And indeed, if you sort cells from the brain using specific markers of neurons, microglia, and you know, the rest of the glial cells, what you basically see is that the neurons are not enriched at all for genetic variants associated with Alzheimer's disease using LD score regression, a capture of heritability explained. Instead, the heritability concentrates very specifically in the microglial enhancers obtained here by HDQ27 isolation in these cell sorted cells. So that basically says that it's extremely important to focus on the specific tissues and cell types where uh, these um, events matter. And in collaboration with Ligo Itai, uh, the director of the Picaro Institute, we basically used the CKP25 mouse model that she developed of early and late Alzheimer's disease. And what we found is that early in the disease, you see changes in the immune processes. And indeed, later in the disease, you see these neuronal changes, suggesting that perhaps inflammation and this immune component 
might actually be the causal genetic component of Alzheimer's disease. And only later do you see these effects that are spanning many cell types. We have since expanded from 127 epigenomes to 834 epigenomes. That has led to many more enriched tissues. This is not quite a fair comparison because we're using different methodologies here, but we're basically finding 30,000 SNPs that are sitting in enriched enhancers. And we're able to take all of the traits that we can now find as associated and start painting a pie chart for each of them based on the set of tissues that each trait shows enrichments in. And in particular, you can see that Alzheimer's sits here with all of the blood uh, and immune traits. By contrast, you can see here schizophrenia, neuroticism, depression, intelligence, educational attainment, which unfortunately are very strongly linked, are uh, both sitting here with the more neuronal populations of the brain uh, samples. You can see here filtration with kidney, you can see cholesterol with liver, and so on and so forth. So let's focus on one of these traits, coronary artery disease, that actually showed the strongest, the most pleiotropic, the most uh, diverse set of tissues. We can see, for example, that QT interval localized very specifically in the heart, educational attainment in the brain, Alzheimer's in immune cells and some, somewhat the brain, body mass index, again, a lot of adipose, as we saw earlier, health span, very uh, you know, diverse tissues, and the most diverse of all was coronary artery with 20 different classes of tissues that are enriched, including liver, coronary artery, thyroid gland, adipose, et cetera. What we found is that if you now start partitioning the genetic variants associated with coronary artery disease into the subset that overlap liver enhancers, then the corresponding genes play very different roles from the coronary artery uh, disease associated loci that instead lie in coronary artery enhancers, distinct from adipose or thyroid enhancers. So that basically tells us that perhaps we can start partitioning the complexity of these complex traits into their simpler components, and then start finding specific co-associations uh, that are actually distinct with these components. We can actually do that at the level of individual loci, going down the rank list of the top 30 GWAS loci for coronary artery disease. We can basically see that some of them are specifically lighting up for liver, others are specifically lighting up for coronary artery, and some for both. Here are some examples. PCSK9, one of the success stories of genetics, is in fact uh, leading very specifically. You can see here the genetic variants, and you can see they're linking specifically to the promoter of the PCSK9 gene. You can see here for a uh, second locus, EDNRA, uh, which is shown here, you see these genetic variants, both proximal and distal to the gene, both of which are in fact showing these heart specific linking to the promoter of EDNRA. If you look at these other locus, uh, PLP3, uh, P3, you can basically see that there are, there, it's a broad region of association and you can see links that are both liver specific and coronary artery specific. And they're in fact pointing to two different genes that are diver divergently transcribed, one expressed in heart and one expressed in liver, suggesting that this locus might actually be an example of a multi-gene, multi-tissue pleiotropy. We have uh, made a website for this, uh, we've chosen an unfortunate name here, EpiMath, that uh, we're now working on EpiAtlas with, uh, with the whole team here. But uh, you can basically browse uh, all of the TF enhanced regulatory links, download, of course, all of the data sets, selecting them in a trace-based way, find all of the enhancer gene links, and also all of the visualizations for 30,000 loci here, where you can see the individual SNPs and how they're linking to specific uh, loci. In addition to painting reference maps of the human epigenome, we're also painting comparative maps of the human genome to basically understand where are the protein coding genes, where are the RNA structures, the microRNAs and the regulatory motifs based on their distinct and characteristic evolutionary signatures. The way that these genes change across different species is very telling of the particular function that is being under selection for those, namely if the selections at the um, protein coding level, at the folding level, at the binding level, and so on and so forth. And uh, what's really exciting here is that by re-annotating the human genome and discovering new protein coding regions, we can actually have an impact on non-coding variation. So here's an example of 118 non-coding GWAS hits 
which turned out to be protein coding after all. So Erwin Youngreis in our group basically collaborated with the GenCode Consortium to expand the annotation of the Human Genome Project and to start annotating new exons. In this particular example, we have a myopia-associated variant that now sits squarely in this retina-expressed protein coding exon, and that provides a mechanism for potentially how this uh, previously non-coding locus is in fact acting. And this is just one of 118 GWAS hits that are now sitting squarely in these uh, loci. We've also extended 236 additional protein coding regions. And we've been doing this for many, many years now. So these numbers are just the latest iteration in 2019, but we've been part of GenCode for uh, you know, nearly two decades now. We've also uh, annotated individual regulatory motif instances using comparative genomics. And again, these maps are only continuing to expand with more mammals. And we're able to point to individual binding sites that are disrupted, that are evolutionarily conserved, but disrupted by SNPs, and these are more likely to be uh, functional. Uh, just in passing, since we're all stuck here uh, at home because of uh, this COVID-19 pandemic, we also use these methods to annotate the SARS-CoV-2 genome using comparative genomics of 44 closely related species that Erwin selected based on their evolutionary distances being close to what you see for the mammals where we know that our methods are uh, quite optimally suited. And what we found is that even though this is 10,000 times smaller than the human genome, there's still actually many hypothetical ORFs. One of them is ORF10 here, the last quote unquote protein coding gene of the SARS-CoV-2 genome, turns out to have no protein coding signatures at all. So what we're finding is that this probably plays some important RNA functions because it is very well conserved. It's just not protein coding. We're also able to find that overlapping this ORF3A gene that uh, was previously annotated, we can actually discover a new gene, ORF3C. There's only 19 genes in the genome, so this is a big deal. Um, a new gene that is actually encoded in a different reading frame, both of which are in fact under strong protein coding selection. And of course, we can look at the rate of change in the sarbacovirus uh, species here, or strains, I should say. Uh, and then the current evolution among different isolates in the current pandemic. And what you can see is that genes that generally evolve fast between different uh, strains uh, are in fact evolving quite fast in the current pandemic. But there's some exceptions, for example, S1, the spike protein one that binds the ACE2 receptor is in fact more slowly evolving in the current pandemic. And the nucleocapsid protein that the RNA wraps around is in fact uh, much more uh, rapidly evolving. We can also start interpreting the mutations that are happening in the pandemic. And so for example, that the D614G mutation in the spike protein that rose to high frequency in many cities independently at the start of the pandemic and is now the dominant form was in fact a human specific change that had never happened in the history of these uh, entire genus here uh, living in uh, bats. So we, you know, perhaps it's a human specific adaptation, uh, but there's an 11 amino acid stretch that was just never changed at the amino acid level. And this particular position was never even changed at the nucleotide level. So we have now these reference epigenome maps and these reference comparative genomic maps of the human genome. But of course, uh, you know, we need variation maps. We need to understand how these change from person to person. So what we're going to be looking at now is how genetic and epigenetic and transcriptional variation together change in disease. The goal is to bridge the gap between genetic variation and disease by profiling these intermediate molecular phenotypes in specific tissues, specific regulatory elements, specific genes, and specific endophenotypes that allow us to now start gaining some mechanistic insights, but also allow us to gain more power because any of these arrows is a more oligogenic arrow that includes fewer variables as opposed to this incredible polygenicity when you're looking for the impact of a single nucleotide variant all the way to disease, of which there are very few that have strong effects similar to APOE or uh, FTO. Of course, the challenge here is that these unidirectional arrows out of genetics are no longer unidirectional in the intermediate phenotypes. There's a lot of feedback from the environment, a lot of feedback from the disease state itself that might be altering these intermediate genes. So what we need to do is develop methods that allow us to get causality back by exploiting the genetic presence 
such as Mendelian randomization. So in this work, we basically collaborated with David Bennett from Russian University that assembled the Religious Order Study and Memory and Aging Project, uh, this ROSMAP uh, cohort that includes more than a thousand individuals that are followed by uh, cognitive evaluations, blood tests, MRI, and all kinds of additional uh, phenotypes for more than 10 years, and that have all donated their brain post-mortem. We have profiled the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex for its methylation, transcription, and many other changes. And as I'm gonna show later in the talk, we've also been doing a lot of single cell profiling across multiple brain regions from those same cohort. The first thing we asked is how does the genome allow us to predict the epigenome? And can we use the two together to start predicting causality for the phenotypes? We looked across the genome for genetic variants on the x-axis that correlate with DNA methylation level on the y-axis. And in particular, here's one example where this SNP here if it's homozygous um, uh, zero or homozygous one or heterozygous, uh, is in fact dramatically al altering the methylation level of the CPG nearby over here. And this is just one of many, 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 many such SNPs. And you can see here positive and negative correlations. And even all the way down here at the twilight zone of detectability, we still have p-values significant to 10 to the minus 12 with uh, quite, quite remarkable effects. So what this means is that if I know the genotype of an individual at birth, I can predict their epigenome in this particular location in an inaccessible tissue like the brain at 93 years of age. So that means that I can start making some inferences about what might actually be happening in a causal fashion driven by the genetics of this individual. So in particular, instead of looking at this very large gap between genetic variation all the way to disease that requires many, many individuals and that only discovers these very small effects, we can start asking for methylation QTLs, quantitative trade loci, that allows to predict the methylation level of a genetic, of a, of a person driven by their genetics. So we can now carry out not just a genome-wide association study, but a methylome-wide association study to look at how methylation between individuals correlates with disease. The unidirectional arrows are now gone because some of that methylation might in, in fact be driven by disease. So, but what we're gonna do instead is not look at all of methylation. We're gonna look at just the genetic component of methylation by imputing methylation from the genetics and then using the imputed methylation to correlate that with disease. And this arrow is once more unidirectional because we're looking at a correlation, yes, but a correlation of something that is driven by inherited genetic variants that are, uh, that are unlikely to be a consequence of a late onset, late stage life disease. So this is now very powerful because we can actually discover new genetic loci. So previously, you can see here, genome-wide significance does not get hit when you're looking at just genetic variants in this large region of the genome. But in the same region, by predicting methylation by combining multiple variants together, we can actually start finding significant associations, which are genome-wide significant because we're now testing many fewer hypotheses with Alzheimer's disease. And we can do this not just with methylation, but also transcription and understand that path of causality. And what that allows us to do is start predicting many new loci that are associated with disease. Of course, in genome-wide significant loci shown here in purple, we can predict the target gene that might be affected by the genetic variants in this locus, and also whether that gene is positively or negatively associated with Alzheimer's that can be helpful for guiding therapeutic intervention. But we can also open up many of these gray regions that are not genome-wide significant, but are still capturing a large amount of the heritability as shown here in the, in the size of the circle. And again, candidate new target genes that were previously unsuspected. We have also uh, profiled a lot of multi-tissue changes. We recently had a paper on uh, with enhancing GTEx, the genotype tissue expression project, by looking at brain, heart, skeletal muscle, and lung from these individuals and looking at M6A epitranscriptomics in a paper that we just published in Nature Genetics. And this is looking at H3K27 acetylation across those individuals. This is the number of K27 acetylation experiments that were done in Roadmap, in ENCODE, in GGR. And this is just from this one study looking across these four tissues. We basically have 387 
uh, different uh, HPK27 isolation experiments. You can see here that they cluster together across brain, heart, muscle, and lung. And you can also start asking, how are these changing between individuals? You can see here the blocks of brain, lung, heart, muscle profiles. And you can also start deconvolving them into these broadly active, these multi-tissue, these novel that were not previously detected in roadmap or in any other project, and these tissue specific uh, profiles. And yes, some brain uh, enhancers are tissue specific to brain, but many are in fact sharing their activity. So we can start partitioning now those enhancers according to their modules of activity across these related projects by exploiting the Roadmap Epigenomics Project and ENCODE uh, GGR and our recent EpiMap uh, publication. So that allows us to now start tracing the impact of genetic variation in the context of gene expression across these multiple tissues and in the context of these epigenomic and epitranscriptomic variation. But everything I've told you so far has been at the level of bulk profiling, of basically looking at how are things changing at the tissue level? And I showed you with Alzheimer's, uh, for example, that microglia only represent a very small part of the tissue and yet play a very big role in the genetic role for the uh, disease. So what we've started doing recently is single cell dissection of these uh, uh, associations. How? By profiling systematically more than 1,500 postmortem human brain samples in the last two years in, in my lab in collaboration, in close collaboration with Li Hui Tsai and a few other uh, labs to basically study changes in Alzheimer's frontotemporal dementia, Lewy body dementia, ALS, Huntington's, psychosis in AD, schizophrenia, and several other brain disorders, but also non-brain uh, disorders. We're looking across all of the major cell types of the brain, including 30 different subtypes of neurons, uh, of excitatory neurons, 23 subtypes of inhibitory neurons, many subtypes of oligodendrocytes, astrocytes, microglia, and more recently, vasculature. We're looking across multiple brain regions uh, that are associated with different brain functions. And we're also looking at single cell RNA and single cell attack. In the first paper that we published about uh, two years ago uh, in collaboration with Li Hui Tai, we basically looked at 48 individuals, 24 without Alzheimer's disease. You can see here high cognitive scores, very low pathology, and then uh, 24 early and late stage AD. And you can see here neurofibrillary tangles, uh, plaques and amyloid, uh, as well as a cognitive decline. This is what the data looks like. You can actually cluster the data by uh, cell type. And you can see this you know, very nice uh, separation of the identities of all of the different brain uh, regions. And in particular, we found that if we, in an unbiased way, subcluster excitatory neurons into two subclusters, inhibitory neurons into two subclusters, astrocytes, et cetera, we're finding basically two subgroups for each of those. And those subgroups are associated with low and high amyloid, early and late BRAC stages, low and high cognitive decline, non-AD and AD. But also female individuals have many more of these pathology associated cells than male individuals, suggesting perhaps a higher transcriptional burden of pathology for female individuals. We also found that the changes that are happening early in the disease progression are extremely cell type specific compared to late, where you see this global shift in very similar processes, many of which are associated with the damage that the cells have at that point and the tissues have at that point occurred. We also found that there's thousands of genes that are differentially expressed between men and women prior to AD. And this number actually doubles for excitatory neurons in the context of Alzheimer's disease suggesting that we should really be thinking about sex-specific and cell type-specific differences. In particular, we found that men upregulated myelination pathways in their oligodendrocytes, a cell type that was previously not very strongly implicated with Alzheimer's disease. And we postulated that this might in fact result in better protection for male individuals for their white matter. And indeed, female individuals that are known to have a much stronger uh, association with Alzheimer's disease are indeed showing increased white matter loss, which basically makes us think that maybe some of the myelination protection drugs should be developed for specifically female uh, patients of Alzheimer's disease. Again, sex specific and cell type specific therapeutic avenues is the, the kind of goals that we're looking for.
We have since expanded beyond the prefrontal cortex to the midtemporal cortex, angular gyrus, entorhinal cortex, thalamus, hippocampus, and mammillary body, profiled seven different brain regions, each in 48 individuals across 1.6 million cells that you can see here in this plot. And you can see this incredible diversity of neuronal subtypes. Of course, our methods, both experimental and computational, have advanced uh, dramatically since then. So you can see this incredible resolution in distinguishing all of the different subtypes using um, uh, several of these tools. In particular, we're finding that there are 30 different subtypes of excitatory neurons. We're able to paint their distinct marker genes that can be very helpful for uh, studies that are capturing uh, these different neuronal subtypes. 23 subtypes of inhibitory neurons. Here's how they change across these different brain regions. You can see here the anterior thalamus, for example, has a very distinct subset of inhibitory neurons. And uh, this is true for the hippocampus, angular gyrus, and several of these cortical regions. And the same is true for glial cells. It turns out that astrocytes vary dramatically between different brain regions, the thalamus, the mammillary body, angular gyrus, so very different signatures, transcriptional signatures of astrocytes. We can also use this resource to start painting a time course, a pseudo time progression of Alzheimer's disease by predicting for every cell based on its transcriptional signatures, how far along the disease progression is it? And using that, we can find early, mid course and late changes of Alzheimer's disease. And we can look at what are the specific genes that are associated with early versus late uh, change in expression, and again, start developing therapeutics against specifically the processes that act early in the disease. We also develop computational methods that allow us to decompose the gene expression by cell expression patterns into modules where we can see these gene gene correlations made explicit and start finding these modules and how they together are dysregulated in the context of disease. That allows us to have a much more robust inference of what are the genes that are changing, complementing the diversity and power of single cell studies with the robustness of a modular analysis. This reveals a lot of uh, microglia associated modules in this example, including these M1 phagosome and immune microglia uh, pathways, mitochondrial genes, glycolysis, interferon alpha, chaperone and heat shock, DNA damage across these different modules and how they associated with distinct phenotypic signatures of Alzheimer's disease. We're also finding both layer and anatopical subregions selective AD vulnerabilities in entorhinal cortex and in the hippocampus. And we're also finding that the cell types that change in coordination in Alzheimer's progression are in fact cell types that are linked, that are known to be anatomically linked in the hippocampal uh, formation and this entorhinal cortex here. That basically suggests that perhaps these uh, communicating regions are influencing each other's pathology, either through signaling or through chemical processes. We also noted that the single cell expression signatures of different subtypes from different anatomical regions are in fact extremely distinct and that their localization and ordering in fact matches the anatomical positioning enabling us to start building these deep learning models for predicting the spatial localization of individual cells using this single cell uh, signature by training this deep learning model in the context of joint data sets in work by Na and Juna. Kai in our group has instead been doing the opposite. Uh, instead of augmenting spatial information from single cell data, is basically deconvolving spatial data into single cell profiles. In this particular example, looking at the cerebellum and how percurrency cell expression is in fact dramatically reduced in the context of ataxia, SCA1, but the marker gene itself for percurrency cells that is usually used as a surrogate is in fact not changing uh, significantly, suggesting that indeed the convolution is extremely important in the case of these spatial studies. In the context of schizophrenia, we're able to again look at the diversity of excitatory and inhibitory neuronal subtypes, including this new cell state, EX for excitatory neuron, SZTR for schizophrenia transcriptional reversal. We're able to now start asking across individuals, how is the pathology that is diagnosed medically correlated with the transcriptional signatures of transcriptional pathology? So we have these polygenic transcriptome score or PTS, similar to the PRS, the polygenic risk score, uh, 
that is basically asking us for each cell type, how schizophrenia-like are the expression patterns of that cell uh, and uh, how control-like. And what's really quite remarkable is that the schizophrenia individuals are, of course, very nicely classified as positive, and that's very encouraging. But there's this one individual here that was a control that is showing transcriptional signatures very much like schizophrenia patients. What's really remarkable about that person is that he's a male individual whose son was, in fact, diagnosed with schizophrenia, suggesting perhaps we're able to see something that was perhaps missed uh, medically. Um, Conversely, the schizophrenia individuals that show control-like patterns for most of their cell types are in fact showing a dramatic abundance of this SCTR cell state, suggesting that this is perhaps um, you know, indication of either another path, another path to schizophrenia or perhaps a transcriptional change that helps restore the transcriptional signatures of other cell types. We're using the differentially expressed genes and the cell types where they are differentially expressed to start annotating the genetic associations with schizophrenia across the genome, as you can see here. And we are able to make predictions as to what are the driver cell types based on where are these genes changing? And also what are the candidate driver genes based on the genes that are showing the strongest change and that are linked using high C evidence and other lines of evidence. Using this, we can predict the upstream master regulators responsible for these changes. And we're grouping these regulators into modules. And one module here in particular is the most enriched for these changes and is also active both in late and in early uh, development and is playing roles in synaptic signaling, synaptic organization, and neurodevelopment, suggesting is, in fact, perhaps a very important therapeutic target that we should be thinking more strongly about. We've also looked at psychosis, not in the context of schizophrenia, but in the context of AD. And what we're finding here is that there's this broad repression of excitatory neuron genes and inhibitory neuron genes in both the prefrontal cortex and in the hippocampus. And these are associated with ribosome biogenesis, neuron projection, autophagy, secretion, signaling, and energy. So this is opposite of what has been postulated as an overactivation uh, in the case of psychosis in um, schizophrenia. In collaboration with Rudy Tanzi, we're also looking at pathogen-associated changes in Alzheimer's disease by looking at CMV, cytomegalovirus, and HSV-1 uh, simplex virus, human simplex virus, and how these are in fact associated with changes across different cell types. What we're finding is that in the context of non-AD individuals, HSV-1 and CMV are in fact showing very similar change across cell types. But in the context of AD individuals, you see a lot of these off-diagonal changes. And indeed, the pathways that are associated with these pathogens, such as increase in inflammation, vessels, uh, decrease in synaptic transmission and pruning, are in fact quite dramatically altered in the context of Alzheimer's, suggesting that, again, there's this interplay between AD pathogens and Alzheimer's disease, and perhaps that there's, in fact, a different form of Alzheimer's associated with these pathogens. We've also been looking at single cell dissection of ALS and FTLD, finding changes in, in sort of multiple endocytosis, autophagy, transcriptional regulation, signaling processes, looking at changes in Huntington's disease associated with the loss of cell type identity between these indirect pathways, spinal projection neurons, and these direct pathways, spinal projection neurons that are quite distinct in control individuals, but are losing their distinct transcriptional signatures in the context of Huntington's disease. We're also characterizing many different subtypes of microglial cells, looking at synaptic microglia versus immunometabolomic uh, mi microglia, homeostatic microglia, inflammatory, these disease-associated microglia, in type 1 interfere microglia. And we're seeing how their proportion is, in fact, changing in the context of Alzheimer's disease. And what we're finding is that the strongest genetic, uh, the, the strongest transcriptional alterations are, in fact, for these synaptic, disease-associated, age-related, inflammatory, and homeostatic microglia. And there's very specific pathways that are emerging, once more pointing to specific therapeutic interventions that we can start uh, undertaking for these. The vasculature plays a dramatic role in the context of Alzheimer's disease. It's very rare that individuals only show pure Alzheimer's but no vascular pathology. And we have now profiled at single cell resolution vasculature-associated cells using both ex vivo capture from epileptic patients, as well as post-mortem in silico sorting, uh, 
And what we're finding is this beautiful zonation that is happening across both endothelial and pericyte and smooth muscle cells. We're finding a new subtype of fibroblast type three here, which is not previously discovered in mouse and we believe is human specific. We're finding these vasculature coupled neurons that and astrocytes and oligodendrocytes that are uh, very closely related to the, to the vasculature and they're showing very distinct transcriptional profiles. And these are not doublets, these are showing very clear uh, signatures that are distinct from both. And we're also using this to find HD associated changes in the vasculature. We're also looking at how these vasculature uh, genes are in fact dysregulated in the context of Alzheimer's disease across the different brain regions. We're finding dramatic differences in the composition of the vasculature cells between different brain regions according to the pathology and the uh, neuroanatomy of these regions. We're able to map more than 70 different GWAS loci at 10 to the minus five with this regulation in specific genes associated with the vasculature. We're able to look at these number of DEGs across different cell types and find that these capillary endothelial cells are showing the strongest changes, predicting again, once more master regulators that could be targeted in this and dramatic changes in the cell-cell communication between these capillary endothelial cells and the signals they're sending to each of these other tissues. We're taking these genes and then linking them using diverse lines of evidence, such as correlation in EPIMAP, EQTLs, single-cell EQTLs, and HIC to start predicting what are the downstream target genes. And again, once more, what are therapeutic targets that we can use here. Looking at single-cell epigenomics, we're looking at single-cell attack accessibility and its correlation with RNA. You can see here uh, the single cell attack data is beautifully delineating these cell type specific marker genes. We're able to distinguish different subtypes of excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons using their single cell attack profiles and paint 60,000 cell type specific peaks across these different cell types. We're finding this dramatic loss in AD for both excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons, especially for male individuals. And we're finding these coordinated changes in AD where the epigenome will basically be active and accessible just as the expression is increasing. And we're finding these global changes between the two. And we're also looking at these AD differential peaks, which are enriched for AD tauopathies, immune function, and several other neuronal disorders. The advantage of looking at epigenome changes is that we can actually start looking at the upstream regulators associated with these changes, once more pointing to candidate therapeutic targets, we had previously published about PD.1 and SPI1 in Nature in 2015 with Li Guizai, but now we've expanded that set with many additional regulators. We're finding that once more, the heritability of Alzheimer's is specifically localizing in uh, microglia, whereas psychiatric disorders specifically localizing in excitatory and inhibitory neuron accessible sites. And we're able to start fine mapping genetic loci that are overlapping these cell type specific microglia enhancers and start painting what are the upstream regulators responsible for these changes. Lastly, we're looking at mosaicism, the somatic mutational burden in the context of disease from the single cell RNA-seq data directly. So from the same experiment of SmartSeq, we can look at the transcriptome of those cells, identifying these senescent cells, which are sitting between excitatory neurons and oligodendrocytes, and we believe are associated with late stage AD and the loss of cellular identity. And we're seeing that these cells are in fact showing this increased burden of somatic mutations, perhaps helping drive their uh, localization to this transcriptional profile, but also helping perhaps uh, explain some of the DNA damage pathways that are altered that ultimately might lead to mutational signatures. So we're looking here at the correlation between genotype to phenotype at single cell resolution. These cells are much more abundant in Alzheimer's dementia individuals that are showing cognitive loss. And uh, they are much more abundant across multiple different classes of annotations. And you can see here several genes that show this dramatic burden of somatic mutations in Alzheimer's individuals, but not at all in non-Alzheimer's individuals. And you can see here that several of these classical AD genes are in fact very strongly enriched in somatic mutational burden. We're using this to start painting genes that show this increased or decreased burden in excitatory neurons and oligodendrocytes and the corresponding pathways, revealing these energy production, signaling, lipid metabolism, and transport pathways specifically associated with these excitatory neurons and these uh, oligodendrocytes that are the ones that are the most close 
to these senescent cells. The same senescent cells that we find in the RNA level, we're able to find at the epigenomic level. We're basically seeing that as individuals progress through late stage Alzheimer's disease, their cells are starting to lose their identity. And we're finding this global epigenomic erosion where in early AD, the accessible sites, the active regions are very accessible and the repressed regions are very inaccessible. But in late AD, you see this reversal where the heterochromatic regions are opening up and the normally active regions are in fact shutting down. And you can see here all of the cells across different cell types sorted by their um, erosion score. And you can see here this reversal of the cells uh, for many of these cell types. And again, we find that these eroded cells are found both in non-AD, early AD, and late AD individuals, but you see this dramatic shift in the distribution for late AD individuals. I see, Guillaume, uh, you've turned on your camera. Maybe I should wrap That's up. That's right. So, I only so have another five, three hours to go. Five minutes to wrap up, <laughs> if you can, Manolis. So, so then we have some time there to... And basically say that we're also integrating single cell uh, and uh, uh, bulk together. We're looking at the subtypes of Alzheimer's disease using the clinical records across electronic health records and cor correlating these subgroups of patients with specific uh, genetic alterations. We're looking at the convergence of multiple tissues in the context of obesity and uh, exercise interventions in human and in mouse across multiple tissues and finding a lot of changes are happening once more in these adipose stem cells, as we had pointed out before, but also in immune cells. And we're finding this global signaling change that is happening with obesity, which is actually reversed with exercise. And we're finding a lot of biomarkers of Alzheimer's in the blood using that monocyte H2K27 acetylation, looking at the rate of aging and APOE4 as two separate components contributing to Alzheimer's, progression of different patients across this uh, disease progression. And then uh, looking at the uh, validation of many of these, looking at perturbations and knockouts of each of these genes and looking at how these are affecting these neuronal phenotypes and then building these high throughput constructs for doing these experiments systematically, reprogramming iPSCs with activation, repression, editing or knockout, and differentiating them into different cell types to start understanding the cell type specific effects, developing a lot of ultra high throughput methods for testing 7 million regions in a single experiment, and then using that to start fine mapping these regions into drivers that are evolutionarily conserved and contain regulatory motifs. And then lastly, testing many of these microglia associated mutations in the context of massively parallel reporter assays with Andreas Penning that are inserted into the brains of mice to start understanding how they're acting in the context of the whole tissue. I will stop by acknowledging this incredible interdisciplinary team. Here's a picture with my drone of both the experimental team and the computational team. Uh, wonderful collaborations in the context of Alzheimer's with Liu Weizai and with many other labs. And uh, we're also always looking for postdocs. Many of these folks have now started their own jobs, uh, their own uh, labs. So uh, we have positions for experimental and computational postdocs. Uh, please uh, come join us. I'll see if there's any questions. Thanks so much, Manolis. It's a bit like watching a recorded talk, but in fast forward, <laughs> it's like two times the speed. I don't know how you can go so fast. So, so we'll actually take the questions. So it's good. We do have time. We have uh, 15 minutes for questions. So we'll take the questions here instead of going to a breakout room. Uh, so if you have questions, uh, please free to type them in the chat or, or to raise your hand. And maybe I'll start uh, with a question. So going back, uh, so I mean, many very interesting things. But one thing I wanted to ask you about, Manolis, is the uh, imputed uh, methylation score and the fact that through that, you're able to, to identify, uh, yeah, exactly, a lot more significant uh, hits. So I, I assume that this, at some level, is dependent on you using the correct tissue, right? When you're, when you're doing the prediction yeah, yeah. of methylation, how, how stable so what's that is. here is that uh, yeah. for every tissue where we can build these QTLs, we basically have a tissue-specific score for every disorder. So if that genetic variant is acting in liver and we're only looking at brain, of course, we're not going to see it. And that's, I think, part of the charm of the method. The fact that even though we're just using genetics for that person, we're mapping the genetics onto the cell type and tissue specific effects that that is having. 
Why is that important? Because that basically means that we can actually take all of disease risk and start partitioning into the specific tissues for each individual. So the way that we're thinking about sort of disease partitioning uh, right now is that we, <clears throat> we're able to now um, start looking at the hallmarks of disease. So basically if we're thinking about Alzheimer's, we can start asking about sort of each of the pathways associated with Alzheimer's start looking at this modularity. And using that, we can basically uh, start taking these predictions, which are tissue specific, and start making them not just tissue specific and cell type specific, but also pathway specific. So looking at these, uh, you know, transcriptional burden, for example, we can take this module approach uh, that I showed earlier, and start asking for each of those modules, how are the genetic variants that this individual carries predisposing them to uh, you know, a, a stronger mutational burden for cycling or for T cells or for glycolysis genes. How is that correlated with epigenomic burden, with transcriptional burden at the single cell level using these genetic variants and their associations? So this is very, very powerful because it basically says, we're not gonna simply say you have Alzheimer's or you're gonna have Alzheimer's. We're gonna say, and you should be watching your lipids, or you should be watching your cholesterol, or you should be watching your, uh, you know, uh, immune uh, interactions, and so on and so forth. Great. Uh, maybe, maybe I'll follow. There's a, uh, there's two questions, but one that specifically continues on what I just asked uh, from Maria Elena. You mind if I read it? Is where I can think about it as I'm reading it. Sure. <laughs> so, Maria, so you mentioned uh, that you were able to predict methylation levels at specific sites in the brain of an individual at 93 years of age. What I didn't catch is how robust is that prediction, probability or correct prediction? Yeah. So we're not going to we're not going to do that for the entire epigenome. We're going to do that specifically for the low side where it is predictable. So over here, you can see that the you know p value is 10 to the minus 205. And again, it's in the top 1%, it's ranked 287. But if you look at the variation, there's still some residual variation. So you can see here that the lowest score for that person is in fact close to the highest score for that person. So yes, the distributions are overlapping, and, but we do have some predictive power. So our goal is not to sort of say, oh, we don't need to measure methylation, not at all. Basically our goal is to truly understand what are the predictable loci? And from that subset of loci, we can then do this and start finding additional genetic variants or genetic loci that are contributing to disease only in the cases where these methods actually have high predictive power. In other words, if our prediction is low quality, we're simply not gonna have that power, but we will know that we will not make uh, a prediction if the, if the power is not there. So that helps answer. Yeah. And, and maybe another question, since you're on this topic, uh, somebody's asking about the distinction between correlation and causation. So can yeah. you explain again how you can break that down here? So the, the trick is to use genetics. Basically, these Mendelian randomization approaches, we have Bayesian approaches for estimating the causal versus non-causal component of these uh, associations with disease. The trick is to basically say, if I have a genetic variant that is contributing to disease, I know that there's causality there. And I can ask how much of that causality, quote unquote, flows through a particular gene or a particular enhancer. So that's sort of the way that we're distinguishing the two. Yes, there's correlation, but the causation can only come, frankly, from genetic associations, but also interventional experiments. And basically what I showed at the beginning of the talk with these interventions is basically saying, yes, indeed, there is causation. When we edit that one variant, we see that there is causality. When we intervene, we see causality. So I think in general, uh, correlation is very difficult to distinguish from causation, but when you have genetics and when you have interventional experiments, you can truly uh, get at that. Thank you. Uh, another question. Could you comment on the gRNA plus DCAS epigenetic machinery constructs that you briefly mentioned? <clears throat> So basically the goal here is, and you know, we're not the only ones in the field who are doing this. There's many, uh, many groups that have started creating these lines that already have the Cas9 machinery within them. So what that allows us to do is now start simply changing the guide RNA and then differentiating those lines into 
uh, neurons, microglia, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, et cetera. So basically what we're doing now is building these lines and start uh, establishing the cellular uh, phenotypes, the baseline, so that we can then start asking, if I change you know, this particular gene, then what happens? So basically, here's an example where we have the wild type uh, neurons, and then we have the knockout of uh, one gene, and then the uh, you know, heterozygous for another gene. And we're starting to see these basically dramatic changes that are happening at uh, the circuitry. And again, there's high throughput ways of actually doing this in neuronal cultures, but in the context of these um, organoids and these in vitro differentiated cell lines, uh, you know, sometimes it is in fact, you know, lower throughput and one at a time. I hope this, this answers the question. So Malo Sri Maitra is asking, are the results regarding somatic mutation based on full length sCRNA data? Actually, why don't you uh, <laughs> finish? <laughs> <laughs> so like, uh, could you please expand upon the results from those analysis and how they relate to the germline variants? Um, so basically what we did here is that uh, we are sequencing the germline from either whole blood or from whole brain tissue. And then we have that individual specific germ, uh, germline reference for the mutational map. Then we're using SmartSeq to effectively look at whole transcriptome and then it's a uh, quite uh, strict computational pipeline to start excluding any kind of mutations that any, any kind of differences that are attributable, for example, to RNA editing, et cetera. And I'm not going to say that we're finding only relevant mutations. Basically, I think the whole field of mosaicism has focused on, you know, 30x sequencing of a single neuron. And yes, I would love to do 30x sequencing of, you know, 6 million neurons. But we, you know, our field can't afford that. This will be the entire NIH budget. What we can do instead is smart seek, and then from the transcriptome, start calling mutations computationally, and then start looking for the differences between the burden of different regions and then the individual level burden associated with phenotypes. So I think what we're losing in um, sort of specificity, we're gaining in. Uh, the ability to analyze these cells. Because even if I spend 30 X sequencing from one neuron, I will not know what that neuron transcriptome is because I will only have the genome. I will not know if its transcriptional profile is sitting here or here or here. So the advantage of this approach is that we have a lot more cells, like by many orders of magnitude more cells. We have you know, thousands upon thousands of cells rather than six cells or 10 cells which is the norm in this field. And we are able to also correlate it directly with the transcriptome. So we're now using G plus T so that we have a direct measure of the genome from those cells. And I'm hoping to report back as soon as we have the results from this. And in this section, I mean, do you see an association between the mutation burden and, and transcription or chromatin state of these yeah. cells? Yeah, I, I, I love that. Basically, what this is basically showing us is G to P, like genotype to phenotype at the single cell level. I mean, I think of individuals as collections of cells. Basically, if you have an increased burden of pathology, an increased burden of epigenome erosion, you're not just, you know, all cells of that person are the same. No, every person has a range of cells. But as you get closer to Alzheimer's pathology, as you get closer to dementia, you basically tend to see more individuals that are shifted in their distribution. And I think that that's how we should start embracing disease. You're not just healthy or sick. You basically have a collection of cellular states across every one of your tissues. And the more neurons shift to this pathological state, the more the circuitry of your brain is gonna be affected. I mean, we know that removing a big chunk of your brain still leaves you plenty of cognitive function. But now as you start losing these cells, I mean, there's of course, cognitive resilience, where many individuals show pathology but don't show cognitive phenotype. So our brain is incredibly resilient, and, and just generally, biology is incre incredibly resilient. So basically, what we're looking at is this accumulation of burden, but across thousands of cells, and I think that's the whole point of these studies. So uh, another question from Martin Hurst. So fantastic work, Manolis. Can you speak a little to the integration of single-cell attack-seq with bulk measurements? 
Are you able to predict what fraction of the epigenetic transcriptional state in a single cell we're able to measure with current methods? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's such a great question. So we are indeed uh, looking at sort of partitioning of that bulk into the single cell. And we're finding, for example, that cell fraction differences are dramatically associated with phenotypic differences. If you look now at, for example, amyloid pathology or cognition, you basically see that individuals that we are predicting from the convolution have fewer excitatory neurons, have you know, more amyloid pathology, and individuals that have more excitatory neurons have more cognition. So this is basically something that comes from deconvolving the bulk data that would not be visible without the deconvolution. Similarly, we're able to find genetic variants that are associated with cell type fraction. We can use cell type fraction as a quantitative trait and then deconvolve that, basically take that deconvolution and then correlate that with genetic variation and then find genetic variants that influence that quantitative trait of cell type proportion. In this example, for example, we're finding that these TMEM106B gene locus, which has a role in frontotemporal lobe degeneration in FTLD, but actually has no association with um, uh, Alzheimer's or Bragg stage or beta amyloid, is in fact very predictive of neuronal fraction and is indeed associated with cognitive phenotypes in uh, Alzheimer's disease. So this is the kind of thing that we can do by this uh, deconvolution. So uh, again, we'd love to have thousands and thousands of individuals uh, at single cell level. We're not quite there yet. We will eventually be there. But in the meantime, we can use the two together for that. So we have time for one last question uh, from Art Petronis. He was asking, why is there such a large age of onset difference between schizophrenia and Alzheimer's disease? So um, I, I, <laughs> it's such a broad question. And <laughs> I'm going to ask the, 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 the much more general question, which is, why are there such dramatic age of onset differences? I think part of the reason has to do with accumulation of burden. In other words, a lot of these neurodegenerative disorders happen to everyone, but at a certain age. In other words, if you're 100, degree, if you're 100 years old and you don't yet have Alzheimer's, there's probably something unusual with you. You're, you're a sort of super healthy ager rather than you're a normal control. So, uh, and, and part of that has to do with the clearing of amyloid plaques. Uh, part of it, that has to do with the huge energetic needs of our brain that are basically causing all of these byproducts of you know, oxidative damage associated with this energy production. Um, of course, there's additional uh, comorbidities with type two diabetes, for example, that is leading to hyperglycemia, which is leading to atherosclerosis, which is leading to infarcts in the brain, which, are, which is reducing the blood flow. And then you can have uh, tissue damage that way. And a lot of these processes are associated with how many of these events are you gonna have in your lifetime? As we age, many of us gain weight, uh, you know, many of us exercise less. There's, there's sort of a lot of changes in the lifestyle of these individuals and there's simply an accumulation of pathology. Humans were not engineered to, lead, to live 300 years or 200 years or 100 years. We, you know, our lifespan has increased dramatically in recent years, largely thanks to advances against you know, microbes, viruses, et cetera. I mean, the death toll from the current pandemic would be enormous without the progress that we have seen. And uh, I think a lot of that comes with the fact that we just simply did not evolve to have this incredibly massively powered brain work for decades upon decades upon decades. Basically, we made some sacrifices, I would say, evolutionarily when pushing down this sort of hypercognitive uh, list, which is now associated with, of course, damage in late age. And that's how I see Alzheimer's as to why the onset of schizophrenia is much earlier. We saw in our, in our results that there's in fact a lot of these early developmental uh, changes that are happening. So, so a lot of that has to do with development, with synaptic signaling organization and neurodevelopment, which is simply where the pathways uh, are. And you can think about age of onset as well in a quantitative fashion. For example, there's a paper that we published recently looking instead of Alzheimer's, yes, no, a quantitative trait of the age of onset of Alzheimer's. And this is actually a much more powerful way to basically identify the amount of burden that is caused by specific mutations. So you shouldn't think of it as, oh, I have schizophrenia. You should think of it as, I have a dysregulation of my excitatory neurons. When will this manifest? I have a dysregulation of the amyloid clearing microglia. When will this manifest? 
And the way that it manifests is at different points based on that severity of the pathology of the you know, mutational burden, epigenomic burden, transcriptional burden, and how these are in fact changing the function of those corresponding cells and when will that manifest? What are the environmental stimuli? For example, we, you know, I, I showed this correlation between uh, pathogens and Alzheimer's disease. So whether you will be exposed to that pathogenic infection might bring up variants that, would have, that you would have otherwise never known about. And it's the same thing with APOE4. If you don't live to 60 years old, you might not even know that you're a carrier. And you know, eventually, if you live long enough, these different things will manifest as you know, the burden accumulates. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Manolis. So, so with that, uh, so we have more questions, but we are out of time, so we're going to stop. I'll ask for a round, a virtual round of applause. Thanks a lot, Manolis, Thank for guys. that great presentation. So we now have a 15-minute uh, break. Uh, after that, at 2.30 is the poster session that's coming, and I would really encourage you to go visit the posters. There's about 50 posters that are presented in this session, and really uh, some, some are excellent from what I've seen. So please attend the poster you session. Know, can I quickly answer Corina's question? People are free to, to log off. <laughs> she has a great question. She's basically asking about single cell change across different brain regions, sometimes distal regions, but are known to communicate. For example, you know, frontal cortex, hippocampus. Do we have a strategy for understanding how individual change of those cells influence their distal synaptic connection? And I think that's a fantastic question. There's a lot of work. There was a whole symposium last week about sort of being able to trace neuronal connections across different brain regions. In the mouse, for example, you can label neurons that are all projecting to the same region. And then you can basically use this anterior projection labeling or this you know, posterior postsynaptic or presynaptic to basically capture cells that were all communicating with the same region. Once you've captured those cells, you can basically do single cell profiling of those cells and find common transcriptional signatures of cells that were projecting to the same locus. You can then computationally start building predictive transcriptional signatures that are asking, can I predict the targets of a particular cell based on each transcriptional signature. And then using that, you can now go to human from the mouse and start asking, you know, if I can for every cell predict its spatial positioning, predict its neuronal connectivity from various aspects of the transcriptome, the epigenome, et cetera, then you can start correlating the transcriptional changes that you see for those cells with the connectivity changes, with the spatial changes, with the you know, pathology and so on and so forth. I hope that answers your question, Corina. Great question. All right. Thanks, you know, Manolis. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so sorry I can't be there in person, but I will be no, there. No. Next time. Uh, All right. So as I posted in the chat, so poster session 2.30 to 4, and then the next session with talks is at 4.15, but you can look at the schedule. Thanks, Manolis, and thanks, thanks everybody. Bye, everyone.